Vance. Uh, I'm really, I'm really pleased to be here today talking to you all about autism and about behavior analysis, which is my uh, field of training, if you will. And my plan is to provide a brief introduction that hopefully sort of lays the foundation for understanding autism and autism research, as well as applied behavior analysis. So as Vance mentioned, I started out uh, more than really 25 years ago in the field. I started in 1994 and I was a teacher at a residential school for individuals with developmental disabilities, including autism. Then after receiving my master's degree from Northeastern and becoming a board certified behavior analyst, I began designing curriculum and consulting to schools. I was helping those schools to set up classrooms for children with autism based on best practice. So to get us started, um, I actually want to go back. To get us started, autism is a neurodevelopmental condition that impacts behavior and communication. This definition, which is sort of slightly paraphrased here, comes from the National Institute of Mental Health. It's often referred to as a developmental disability due to the fact that it often manifests early as young as 18 months to three years of age. And I wanna pause here and touch upon the language that I'll be using during my brief talk today. Uh, there are really two ways that we might refer to an individual with this diagnosis. We might use person first language, which is to say an individual with autism, or we might use identity first language, which would be to refer to an autistic person. And I participated in this News at Northeastern story back in 2018. And I really think that the journalists did a very elegant job describing this debate. The reason they decided to even look into this debate is that they had published two previous stories on autism in which person first language was used. So they used the term autistic person and they received feedback from some people in the greater community who found this objectionable. And so they decided to kind of look into this issue a little bit deeper and they asked me to participate in this, uh, in this article. For the purposes of my talk today, I typically use person with autism or I sometimes use the term autism community when speaking about the community at large. And I've heard directly from families and from parents who say that this language is preferred, but I do want to acknowledge that many who have the diagnosis themselves prefer person first. Just something to be aware of. Now, in terms of the prevalence of autism, most recent estimates suggest that one in 44 births are to a child with autism. And when I first entered the field back in the mid 90s, the prevalence was one in, one in 550 births. Wow. So as you can see, there's been a real increase in the diagnosis over the last 25 years. Now, experts say that some of this increase can be attributed to better diagnosis. So we see more um, children are being diagnosed with autism. But generally speaking, there is agreement that autism is in fact on the rise. It's noteworthy that more boys than girls are diagnosed with autism. And in fact, they're four times more likely to be diagnosed with autism. And as a result, one in 27 boy births are diagnosed with autism, whereas one in 116 girl births are diagnosed with autism. We see this diagnosis across all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups, although we'll talk a little bit later about disparities in access to services that we sometimes unfortunately see. Although no single cause has been identified, scientists have begun to identify important genetic components. Twin studies especially suggest that autism is genetically based. If one identical twin has autism, then there is a 36 to 95% chance that the other twin will also be diagnosed with ASD. For non-identical twins, the chance is about zero to 31%. And then the chance that siblings will both be affected is about two to 18%. So if you're a parent and you already have one child with autism, then potentially another child that's born could also be born with autism somewhere between two to 18% sometimes right around that 10% is what they're told. Now, some experts believe that there is an interplay between genetics and environmental variables that may lead to autism and that somehow something in the environment might cause a gene to express autism. 
I also just want to say, and I was actually, when Matt and I were speaking earlier, we were talking about how oftentimes when we think of an individual with autism, we think of a child. But I think it's important to recognize that children, of course, grow into be adults. And so when we talk about individuals with autism, we're talking about a broad range of individuals. Um, it's often said, if you've met one person with autism, then you've met one person with autism, right? So they're all very different. Everybody's so different and unique. And um, not just children, adults as well. And oftentimes there's comorbidity between autism and other diagnoses as well, which is important. Now my training, as I said earlier, was in Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA. And broadly speaking, ABA is considered to be a branch of psychology in which the science of behavior is applied to solve socially significant problems. When applied to learning and to behavioral challenges among those with autism, a behavior analytic approach begins with goal setting. So identifying what specifically you're going to be working on. It continues with a comprehensive assessment of the behavioral deficit or the behavioral excess. And then an intervention is implemented based on the principles of behavior. And finally, progress monitoring occurs. Now, assessment is really key to this process. So I wanna highlight this part of it. It includes an investigation of the conditions under which behavior is likely and not likely to occur, as well as capturing both environmental and biological factors that might be influencing behavior and learning. Applied behavior analysis has been found to bring about meaningful change in individuals with autism. It's endorsed by Autism Speaks, by the US Surgeon General, by the National Institute of Mental Health, and by the American Psychological Association as effective evidence-based intervention. All 50 states now, within the last five to 10 years actually, have enacted some version of an autism insurance law that requires insurance companies to reimburse ABA services for individuals with autism. So who provides these services and how do they receive their training? Um, I have to apologize in advance for the number of acronyms that we use in our field. Sometimes it sounds like we're talking about alphabet soup, but I do think it's important to know that in 1998, the Behavior Analysis Certification Board, or BACB, was established with the mission of protecting consumers of behavior analysis services and increasing the availability of qualified behavior analysts across the world. And they established the very important professional and ethical compliance code that includes over 75 standards for behavior analysts across multiple areas of the discipline. The BACB provides certification, including for board certified behavior analysts, for doctoral level board certified behavior analysts, for assess assistant level board certified behavior analysts and for registered behavior technicians. And you see that we also have here uh, licensed applied behavior analysts. That licensure is provided by the state of Massachusetts. I started out talking about applied behavior analysis very broadly, but as you can see here, the vast majority of board certified behavior analysts are in fact providing services to individuals with autism. And these data come directly from the BACB. Even so, there's a great need for behavior analysts. Families often experience long waiting times, sometimes months or even years for services for their children. And we know that early intervention is so important in terms of making progress. So this is a real problem. I also want to emphasize some important clinical considerations with respect to the application of, of behavioral science to the autism community. So first of all, it's incredibly important that generality of behavior cha change is plain, planned for when designing intervention plans. Generality is a defining characteristic of behavior analysis, and it's achieved when the target behavior occurs not just in the teaching environment, in the presence of the BCBA, but also across different contexts and different people. Additionally, social validity must be assessed. And this involves the behavior analyst assessing the acceptability of the intervention and including the individual themselves as well as family members in every step, including goal setting and progress monitoring. As with other helping fields, an empathic approach is required when working with individuals and their families. With respect to the families, they can be facing many stressors and this should really be considered. Compassionate care is really key. 
I mentioned when I spoke about assessment that this assessment should include investigation of both environmental as well as biological factors that might be influencing behavior. Without the inclusion of biological factors, assessment will be incomplete and interventions will not be effective. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge that there are disparities in terms of access to services. So certainly more research is needed in this area in order to tackle the problem. But a study by Zalecki and colleagues in 2011 suggested that parents of color were less likely to contact a doctor with their concerns. They experienced longer wait times to have their children evaluated. And they were generally less satisfied with the services that their children received from doctors and other healthcare providers. So this clearly needs to be addressed. Switching gears a bit to talk about research, um, I did want to highlight four people in the field of behavior analysis, four greats really in the field of behavior analysis, all of whom were Northeastern professors and researchers. So in the top left here, we have Dr. Murray Sidman, who was in the psychology department in the College of Science. Dr. Sidman literally wrote the book on stimulus equivalence that is used in probably every graduate program in applied behavior analysis. We also have Dr. Myrna Libby, who taught at Northeastern for many years and published prolifically, mainly on the application of chaining to teach new skills. Dr. Harry Mackay, who was Pre Professor Emeritus in the College of Science, he published groundbreaking work on the effectiveness of token systems to improve behavior. And then finally, here in the bottom right, we have Dr. Dan Gould, who helped to launch Northeastern's Master of Science in ABA back in the 1970s, and whose research focused on conditioned reinforcement. And then we also have a photo here of some of our wonderful students at a graduation, recent graduation, back when we were able to gather together for graduation, which hopefully we'll be able to do so again soon. So in terms of my own research and innovation, I'm gonna share two main areas with you. The first was mentioned by Vance in his introduction, and that's the Autism Curriculum Encyclopedia, or ACE, which I co-created along with my colleague, Renee Mansfield, who has um, since passed away, but really uh, left an amazing legacy. And our vision in creating the ACE was to provide assessment tools, teaching programs, and data systems to track progress that could be used by behavior analysts and by direct care providers as they were working with individuals with autism across the world. We received a patent for the ACE and after several evolutions. The ACE now has over 10,000 registered users across the globe and includes over 2,000 lesson plans. So the ACE includes lesson plans for anything from increasing independence, toothbrushing, to learning a new vocational skill, to crossing the street safely, to identifying letters and numbers. Those are all included in the ACE as well as many, many more uh, different targeted skills and behaviors with teaching programs based on best practices identified in the literature. I also conducted a study a couple of years ago on effective procedures for conditioning neutral stimuli as reinforcers for learning learners with developmental disabilities. So individuals with autism and other disabilities sometimes have restricted interests with only a few items or a few people serving as reinforcers. And as a result, attention has been given to how we might expand the number of items that serve as reinforcers. And we've tried different methods over the years. And in our study, students were selected uh, for whom verbal praise did not serve as a reinforcer. So the five participants who participated in our study, for none of them, it seemed, verbal praise from a teacher um, actually served to reinforce behavior. We then systematically paired a praise statement. Um, we chose the statement way to go as our praise statement. And we paired that praise statement with a reinforcer, with an established reinforcer, following the occurrence of a target behavior. And over time, we observed that the praise statement did begin to take on reinforcing properties for four out of five participants. And this has clinical significance, right? As the use of praise is readily available and occurs naturally to reinforce behavior. So we were excited about these results and are hoping to extend them in the future. Finally, I thought I would share with you all 
this could take a long time. So I think I'll just go ahead and click so you can see. I thought I would share with you all the list of behaviors that have been improved through behavioral interventions, both within the autistic community, as well as outside of the community. And I found this list by doing a quick search in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, which is our flagship journal in the field. And this hopefully gives you a sense of the broad application of ABA. And I'll also show you the next page, which likewise has many different areas of intervention. There's been a lot of um, success in behavioral interventions that have targeted these different areas. So if you see a topic here that relates to your own research and you'd like to talk about the overlap, please feel free to reach out to me or you could reach out to one of my colleagues, Dr. Nicole Davis or Dr. Maeve Donnelly, and we'd love to talk to you about potential overlap. And that's it, so thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, are there any questions? Well, actually, here, let me, since I'm unmuted, I will actually <laughs> applaud since we don't get thank that you. on Zoom anymore. Um, yeah, are there any, if, if anyone has any questions or uh, has anything to say, you can either put in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself. I have a question. Um, this is really interesting work that you presented. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you, uh, in addition to within your own area of expertise, if, if you consider or would like to consider bringing in information from say psychological, psychology disciplines like brain imaging or things like that into your, um, into your area that if you've considered uh, that doing that. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, you know, one of the emerging areas of research that we're looking at is starting to explore what we might have previously thought of as private events within a behavioral framework. And so this absolutely involves things like, you know, brain imaging is one example, but another example is, you know, when we start to look at, for example, um, indicators of stress, right? So that so when we feel stressed out. Um, our heart rate increases, our breath rate increases, we're, our palms are sweating. We have all these responses, which sometimes are not visible. So we refer to those, behavior analysts tend to refer to those as private events. But we're starting to explore, and we've done some interdisciplinary work with um, health sciences and uh, engineering on this topic in terms of how might we start to uh, take what was a private event and make it more overt behavior that we can actually measure and uh, you know provide support for and intervene in sort of a positive manner. So I think there are, are real opportunities here for that kind of inter interdisciplinary work. Um, we have a very um, scientific framework that we follow within behavior analysis. But I think because of that framework, behavior analysts often tend to shy away from that kind of work, but I think it's it's work that, that really has to be done. And I, so I think that there's real opportunity there. So for example, there's a kind of a movement towards development of wearable sensors. Exactly. Or yeah. maybe an you know, Apple Watch app kind of <laughs> less exactly. invasive. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I actually participated on a grant along with my colleagues in health sciences and engineering on a smart ring. And what we were looking at was, well, first we had to work towards the, the validity of that device, right? Make sure that it's actually measuring what we want it to measure. And then starting to think about now that we have established that this is in fact measuring what we want it to measure, how can we use it in a way that um, almost like cognitive behavioral therapy, a way where the wearer themselves can become aware of their own physiological responses and then manage those responses, you know, in a particular way. That so, makes sense. So that like was a the, grant. you yeah. know, the haptic tap of the Apple watch or, you know, something like right. that. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And in fact, on this grant that we were working on, we actually looked at all kinds of things. We would looked at all of the reviews of the Apple watch to see what people loved and hated about it so that we could then kind of incorporate that into our smart rank project. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, opportunities there, I think. Uh, Hazel, I see your hand is up. Thanks, Vince. Hi, everyone. And um, Laura, thanks so much. It's really fascinating. I guess I have a question for you also, and that it's it's for Matthew, um, you know, after his talk as well, which is what is the opportunity for Northeastern here? Where, um, and, and I think that that actually is the goal of the 
this series of talks, you know, what's the opportunity for us? How can we collaborate across colleges? I, for example, use zebrafish in my work to look at the effects of um, mutations in human autism risk genes. And we have very profound changes we can see. You know, how do we put together our research in ways that are really powerful to bring together the human analyses and the animal models that um, really can make Northeastern shine and really put us, poise us for outstanding research funding together. So just so you know, that's kind of my, <laughs> my real, one of my real interests here. And I'm curious if you have a sense of, you know, where's the opportunity for Northeastern um, in this particular area? Matt, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. I mean, I, the, the, my quick answer uh, well, first is thank you for raising that because I think there's a real opportunity and I think the seminar series is intended to stimulate some of this. Jean Tunick, our Associate Dean for Research at Uve has got a research task force and I think is trying to help us all understand that each other are working in, in potentially complementary scientific ways. Sarah Ostadavas does computer vision with interest in early autism. Zheng Zhan looks at language and, and neural functioning. Joanna, I haven't met yet, but I'm aware that she's also looking at, at language development. I, I'm going to be presenting some work that shows collaboration with engineers and computer scientists. Laura has got expertise in, in behavioral and teaching and assessment. I mean, it's a natural fit with those who are here now for us to be um, getting to know each other's work a bit better, both I think in terms of basic and method development and then interesting research questions that have um, use inspired um, societal impact. So I, I think the more that we can get to know each other and, and make time to educate each other on our science uh, and tackle a common problem, um, Northeastern would be very poised to, to innovate in this, in this uh, condition. Well, I think that's awesome. I'm, I think that that's exactly why we're here. And thanks to Aaron and to um, Jean for really bringing together this group of investigators across science and Bouvet and beyond. It's fantastic. And, you know, for Vance for putting this um, actually together. So thanks a lot. Look forward to continuing the discussion. Keith? Can I ask a quick question before we move to Matt? And I'm very excited to hear how, how Matt's portion is going to dovetail on Laura's. But I, I guess my question is to Laura, but um, Matt, it might dovetail on some of the stuff that you might will be touching on. So Laura, you know, a lot of, I forget the word that you use to describe, uh, were they private events? Uh, yes. The clinical term? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are really kind of, um, latent type of um, uh, variables that are not readily observable necessarily to um, uh, an observer, uh, maybe to a clinical trained eye they are uh, to some degree. I'm wondering whether, you know, here wearable technology presents uh, another opportunity here in terms of quantifying things that we just haven't been able to quantify before um, yeah. and track, you know, all of that. Yeah, I'm, I am excited to hear Matt's uh, presentation and he, he's probably gonna get into some of that. Uh, what I would just add to what I said earlier about the private events is that, you know, behavior analysts are very good at observing and measuring mm. behavior that is observable. <laughs> uh, they're not as good at, well, observing of course, but measuring and intervening for behavior that's not observable. And what's interesting is that behaviorists, specifically radical behaviorists, acknowledge that a large part of the equation is in fact influenced by private events, that we all have thoughts and we all have emotions and that we all have responses that aren't always readily viewable. Um, having said that, having acknowledged the presence and importance of private events, nobody in my field, I shouldn't say nobody, but most in my field, and maybe Matt will be the one who will help us with this, have really been able to figure out a good way to, to measure and to, and to observe and to intervene. And so I think this is an area that is um, really exciting. And um, I think what we could can do together is to use this really scientific approach to um, start to address some of these private events using technology. 
So I think there's there's sort of a potential marriage there between a behavioral framework and um, you know technology and innovation that can allow us to start to see some of the things that we weren't able to see before. Uh, Pete Bex, I think you have your hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm wondering how the gains that you achieve by focused training transfer to other symptoms in the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, can you can you achieve benefits in untrained areas like hypersensitivity or repetitive behaviors from concentrating on language, for example? Yeah, it's really really interesting. You know, oftentimes we intervene for one behavior and we see really lovely collateral effects in other behaviors. Uh, sometimes we see collateral effects that aren't so lovely. And so I think it's important to kind of plan for that. We can't always do that, but oftentimes we do see this. And, you know, one example is extinction procedures, which produced response variability. Um, one study that comes to mind used extinction and was able to produce variability in responding that ended up allowing for more sophisticated play responses among young children. So, you know, we certainly can design interventions once we start to uh, start to discover some of these collateral effects that we can achieve through these interventions. But sometimes it's a little just bit ser serendipitous, right? So it sort of happens and then we say, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And of course, if we weren't expecting it, we might not be measuring it. So oftentimes those collateral effects are more sort of anecdotally reported, but certainly it's been found in, in some of the literature. Excellent. I think at this point we'll move on to our second speaker, but if you have other questions, we will have time for more discussion uh, after Matt's talk. So let me introduce him now. Um, our, our next speaker we're very happy to have is uh, Dr. Matthew Goodwin. He has over 20 years of experience and clinical ex research and clinical experience working with children and adults on the autism spectrum and developing and evaluating innovative technologies for behavioral assessment and intervention, including video and audio capture, telemetric physiological monitors, accelerometry sensors, and digital video facial recognition systems. And it looks like he's able to share just fine, so take it away. Thank you, Vance, and thank you, uh, Jean and Laura, for questions and comments that teed this up perfectly. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot that my lab, the Computational Behavioral Science Lab at Northeastern, um, engages in a lot of various research uh, involving individuals with autism, but I wanted to focus today based on some pre-conversations that Laura and I had, um, specifically on wearable sensing and machine learning classifier development as it relates to um, repetitive and challenging behaviors, which I'll define better as we go forward. So before we sort of start talking about autism, just panning back, um, I, I refer to this technology, this general class of technology as telemetrics. Um, what makes it common is that you've got a sensing device that can be uh, installed in the environment. There is a subdiscipline of computer science called ubiquitous computing that is interested in this. Um, and then uh, we can place objects on people's bodies or things that they carry accessories. That's wearable computing. What is common across these two strategies is that you've got a sensor that is passively recording information and it is using a um, common timestamp. And th those recordings can be made locally, but data can be saved offsite in a, in a centralized source with very exact timing information. And so uh, there have been a variety of different writing and, and researchers who are interested really in trying to address some of the negatives of laboratory-based research. We obviously use laboratories because we can have good control over a standardized environment and, and we can be um, good at adhering to protocols of when we introduce different variables to be able to evaluate what effect they're having on the respondent. But some of the limitations of that laboratory-based science um, I have listed here in front of us. In fact, one of my favorite maxims was by Yuri Bronfenbrenner, a developmental psychologist. And he said that the business of child development research was, was um, putting people in strange places with strange people doing tasks they've never done before for ill-defined periods of time and expecting them to act naturally. When you have a highly heterogeneous population by which the condition is defined as having some uh, aversion to novelty and social other people, you can start to see how laboratory-based science and autism can, can 
um, reduce compliance, it can increase reactivity, what we might call the Heisenberg principle, or that the behavior is being changed by the presence of somebody else, not necessarily the independent variables that you have under study. Um, and oftentimes we have to question those who can comply with laboratory-based studies, are they representative of the larger autism population? And I, I'll address some comments to this going forward um, in the slides, but we have an overabundance of representation of high functioning autism in the literature, um, in part because they're a convenient sample to the researcher and our preference for doing laboratory-based research. I'm not in any way, shape or form um, suggesting that, la that laboratory-based research is not important and critical. I think it is very much, but we don't have as much research um, deploying quantitative measures in naturalistic environments over long, long periods of time. So instead of bringing individuals to the lab, can we uh, essentially instrument uh, the world or a person and take the lab to them? And so the argument would be for some of these telemetrics, and I have, have made this argument in the published literature, is if we had better representation, if we could reduce reactivity through passive recording, if we could measure behavior where it happens, we can e increase ecological validity. We can measure multimodal with sensing technology in a way that doesn't rely on just one dependent variable to try to summarize a more complicated interactive interaction between systems. So we can, we can look in a multivariate fashion. The nature of this data, because it's all essentially time series, lends itself very well to data visualization and hypothesis generation um, that we could then confirm with more controlled studies. And then to the extent to which you know what signal you're looking for in your data, um, we, can, we can provide just in time uh, adaptive intervention or feedback. And I'll give you some examples of that in the work I'll share forward. So there's two primary examples I wanted to share with you all today quickly. Um, the first is gonna be in stereotypical motor movements. This is within one of the, the defining diagnostic uh, characteristics of autism, which is restricted and repetitive behavior. And then the, the next will be challenging behavior like aggression and self-injury. In both cases, we're using sensing um, on body wearable sensing um, of, of two different nature. So just first to define this general uh, area, I dug through the literature looking for a consensus definition of what is a stereotypical motor movement. And they seem to coalesce around three defining criteria, that they're motor sequences that appear to the observer, this is important to remember because this is all about the perception of the person who is viewing and recording, to be invariant in form. That means every time the person engages in these motions, they tend to look the same. That to the observer, they have no obvious eliciting stimulus. It is not clear to us what has happened in the environment that would have occasioned the onset of these behaviors or would occasion the offset of these behaviors. And then third is that they have no adaptive function. They're not intentionally deployed by the individual for some set purpose. Um, hand flapping, body rocking, and finger flicking are the topographies that are the most represented in our uh, epidemiological data. I will challenge all three of these underlying characteristics and would argue that these are artifacts of low resolution of recording. And I hope to convince you of this when I show you some of the data that is coming forward. Now, it's pretty abstract, the descriptions I was giving you, so let me be very concrete. Sorry. Um, each of these individuals is engaging in the same class of behavior. Repetitive use of the body, repetitive use of hands. Each of them is doing it with a slightly different topography. Each of them is doing it at a different frequency. Each is doing it, or rate, let's say. Each are doing it at a different duration and each are doing it at a different intensity. And they're happening quickly. And so I want you to see an example of what these behaviors are, but I also wanna challenge you to think about how well do you think that you could, with fidelity and accuracy, tell me when you were watching these live how many, when did they start? When did they end? How many times did they do the resolution? And what rating of intensity could I give you? And the punchline for this, right, I'm setting this up, is that the highest inter-rater reliability I've seen in the published literature for live two-person annotation of this class of behavior is 33% agreement. That means that if those people turn their back and guessed, they have a 50% chance of reaching agreement in a way that they do not when they're taking all of their bandwidth to attend to this. These behaviors are clinically significant. They're stigmatizing. You signal to somebody else in an environment that you are atypical. When you 
see these behaviors, we often see them at a high rate. And if you try to response block someone or extinguish these behaviors, prevent them from carrying it out, they can become anxious and agitated and sometimes escalate their behavior into uh, aggression or, or other challenging behavior. It, if you're doing this at high rates, not only are you signaling to other people that you're atypical, but you're also preventing acquisition of new skills or new learning. We may underestimate the intelligence of the person who does this, and they may be missing opportunities to learn from others in their environment. And clearly, if you bring all these together, it, it can very much complicate social integration in, in community settings, um, schools and the workplace and at home. So it, it's a behavior that we typically need to manage. It's often in individualized education plans and goals for families that prioritize this as something where they would like support from a, a, a behind, applied behavior analyst. Now, in and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give the caveat that it's been more the radical behaviorists where I have heard this following message, but the clinical consensus often for this class of behavior is that um, it's non-functional, it's not regulated by the individual. It's usually intended to escape or avoid a demand or to seek or attract attention. But that is not the only function that has been proposed for these behaviors. Some have suggested that these are alternative communication mechanisms in the absence of language. Some have suggested that this is how an individual regulates their stress, increase or decrease their arousal to achieve a, a autonomic set point, that some uh, engage in these behaviors to up or down regulate environmental sensation, and others who have suggested uh, proprioceptive, so that for some individuals, this is how they feel their body in space and time. They're getting enhanced external input that gives them a better sense about how they're positioned in their environment. Um, we have data that supports all of those putative functions. So this also tells us that it might not be a one size fits all. Um, people may engage in a similar topography, but for an entirely different um, underlying purpose. We also have seen that individuals who engage in these behaviors early in life, some maintain them late in life, some seem to increase in these behaviors, some decrease, some may start as a, as a biological um, purpose or function for this behavior that acquires social meaning once they realize that others respond to them differently. It's, a very, com it's very complicated to understand the function and its maturational course. And the reason why this becomes quite significant is if we're going to intervene to teach, we don't want to just extinguish this behavior because it looks weird. If it's providing a vital function for somebody to communicate or regulate their stress or feel their body in space and time. The trick is to understand what is the function so that it could be replaced with a more socially acceptable way of achieving that function. And that's more difficult to do. But if we can do that, and I'm going to argue that a step along that way is, is more quantitative means of gathering uh, information on the topography and the frequency and the, intens the intensity and duration, we may get better at identifying underlying function that helps us guide more personalized interventions, um, either behavioral or ph pharmacological, tailored specifically for that, in for, for that individual. And the very process of getting a good accurate baseline of these behaviors is any natural, be, you know, uh, quasi-experimental or, or experimental intervention, we have a very good outcome measure to document uh, if and when change happen. Autism is also not the only condition that engages in these classes of behaviors. We see this as a cardinal um, feature in a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders like uh, Leshnayan syndrome and Phelan McDermott, Rett syndrome, Tourette syndrome, Engelman syndrome. So having a standardized means to collect this motor information that we can compare and contrast across different developmental um, conditions may tell us something about underlying pathophysiology that may differentiate um, um, life course for individuals um, who engage in these behaviors. So this is work that um, I was doing originally at MIT before I came over to Northeastern. Stephen Antilly now is also um, at Northeastern. He's in Cori. He's been a long time colleague uh, in this. He um, works in ubiquitous computing. He had an early version of accelerometers before we had Apple phones and we had Apple watches. This is essentially the sensor in your phone that knows if you were in landscape or portrait mode. This is also the sensor that's in a Fitbit where they are estimating step counts based on 
um, gravitational force in the X, Y, or Z axis, pitch, yaw, and roll. So these are ubiquitous sensors now in a lot of our devices. But at the time, um, he had an early prototype of it. And so basically what we did, and I hope this video makes clear quickly, um, I was putting some of these sensors on each wrist and on the torso. This is the left wrist. This is the right wrist. This is the torso. There are three axes within each sensor, pitch, yaw, and roll. Um, X, Y, and Z. So you see three different colors per each signal. Uh, this was at the Grodin Center in Providence, Rhode Island. This is in a classroom. The student is in his naturalistic setting. We videotaped um, the session. So the video is time synchronized um, with the sensor clock. And so what I hope you can see is when he engages in hand flapping, you see bursts of activity in the left, torso, or left um, wrist and right wrist. You see minimal activity in the torso stream. And then he's going to transition here in a second and he's going to start rocking back and forth. And what you'll see is that the um, signal is start is going to be picked up primarily in the torso stream. And it's going to show you some sinusoidal waves of every time he goes forward and every time he comes back. What you see on the right is offline coded frame by frame by two independent ground truth behavior analysts. What was the topography, the start time and the end time of each of these? So what I hope at this point, based on what I've showed you, if I had a clever way to cover the video with this very brief exposure of training, you should be able to tell me when he's not engaging in a repetitive behavior, when he is of what nature, those are flaps and then those are rocks. You should be able to tell me, guesstimate when it began, when it ended, how long it lasted. And then given the intensity of these motions, um, something about how vigorously he's engaging in the behavior. So what we did, and I'm going to show you next, is we took 50 training examples where we have labeled accelerometry data and we fed it to a decision tree classifier. So 90, um, uh, about 90 percent of our data algorithm had never seen before. So we, we trained it on 10 percent of the data, which basically means 50 percent of instances when an individual engaged in a behavior that it was labeled. And then we compared the classifier's performance to the ground truth labels that it didn't trade on. And for these six individuals, our average accuracy was 90%. So what that means is once these, each of these individuals had 50 examples of their behavior that we had a, label, a ground truth label for, then the 90% of the data the classifier didn't see. When fed this raw data, the classifier correctly identified the topography, the onset, and the offset of these behaviors. So this isn't sensing something a human can't sense. What it's doing is it's rapidly learning and then carrying that out in an automated fashion. So that once you trained or calibrated that uh, classifier, it can run independently automated in a way that would suggest um, the same level of accuracy as, as coded behavior offline frame by frame, which clearly is not, um, is not scalable. Something else that was interesting in these findings is when we leave one individual out of training and we do testing, we had a wide span of variation. For some individuals within the classifier had never seen any of their data, it correctly identified when they were rocking or flapping or doing both 95% of the time. But for some, it was low as 17%. What that suggests is the heterogeneity and how these mo movements are performed um, can vary in the population, which means we need lar larger data sets from greater numbers of people to have enough of the movement variation represented that you could get up to say 90% in any new person coming um, in your system later. And then to get back to something that Laura was saying about um, private events or what I call biological setting events, and Skinner said at the outset, right, it's not that private events in biology aren't driving behavior. It's that we can't see them, so we can't study them never said that they weren't important to development or to behavior. We just didn't have the technological sophistication to access those with, with good reliability and validity. I think it's time to revisit that because we do have sensing technology that lets us do this now. In the absence of someone's self-report, we can observe directly how is their, their peripheral nervous system responding before, during, and after behavior. So here is an example, again, looking at those stereotypical motor movements. These are 10 individuals with autism in the same experimental setup I showed you before. But what I didn't tell you before is that vest that he's wearing has a three lead ECG. It has a respiration belt, both di um, diaphragmatic and, and pneumatic. So up on the chest and down over the diaphragm. And it's giving us information on um, heart rate and heart rate variability continuously. 
And what I'm showing you here in the video, this is heart period. So this is the converse of heart rate. This is how psychophysiologists like to quantify this measure, but I know it's somewhat counterintuitive. When this signal goes down, it means heart rate is going up. When the signal goes up, it means heart rate is slowing down. What you notice in this video is that there are rapid acceleration of heart rate prior to the onset of the behavior. It reaches asymptote while he's engaged in the behavior. And then it starts to come back, um, start to slow back down at a lower rate than when it had increased before. And interestingly, this is one of 10 participants for three different classes of behavior. Well, four really, if you combine any flap or rock or simultaneous as one bout, or you just look at rock, or you just look at flap, or you just look at flat rock, across all 10 people, we saw the same canonical waveform where one to four seconds prior to the onset of the behavior, you get a rapid acceleration in heart rate. It slows as they're starting to do it and it comes back slower and their subsequent baseline is lower than their preceding baseline. So this statistically fit um, in, uh, uh, I think it was a third order or fifth order, sorry, polynomial response for all 10 participants for all three classes of behavior. Now, what that says to me, I, I don't wanna go so far as to say now that anybody who flaps or rocks is doing this to homeostatically regulate, but it, it does not rule out the possibility that some people are doing this internally to try to achieve uh, autonomic equilibrium, which means the last thing I wanna do is stop them from doing it if I haven't given a replacement strategy for them to be able to regulate their stress. Transitioning over now, so uh, somewhat similar approach, but now we're talking about challenging behaviors in autism. Um, these are things like aggression to other people, self-injury, uh, property destruction, or extreme tantrums. This is one of the primary reasons that families refer their children to um, specialized behavioral health care. Um, it is one of the primary classes of behavior that keeps kids out of regular education settings. Um, parents will report that their children who engage in these behaviors are often deemed unsafe um, because they don't know when they're gonna, gonna engage in a challenging behavior. So they don't go to the movies, they don't go to restaurants, they don't go to church, they don't go to um, many of the normalizing places where children uh, typically get to interact and learn from others. It's a safety risk for that individual and it's a safety risk for people who are in that environment. It's especially problematic in the more nonverbal population. So 30 to 40% of more severely affected or profound autism who have no language or minimal language, um, parents and clinicians will report that these behaviors seem to, to come out of the blue. They, they, there was no overt precursor that, that let them be aware that an issue was coming where there was an opportunity to intervene. So, um, my research group has sort of reconceptualized these behaviors, not as oppositional and defiant, not as escape or avoidant, not as um, forensic or sort of kids willfully taking pleasure in harming other people, but to think of this instead as homeostatic, as stress regulatory, as maladaptive responses. In the absence of being able to tell somebody, I am experiencing pain or distress or sensory overwhelming, when they engage in these behaviors, they often receive um, additional attention, sometimes mechanical restraints, sometimes they're removed from that setting. There may be rewarding properties in, um, it's invasive to have someone treat you that way, but they're removing you from the stressor. And so individuals who cannot communicate this experience and who might be engaging in these behaviors, our hypothesis is that they do not have uh, adequate emotion regulation um, or, or coping skills. And so we can get stuck in this negative feedback loop where someone has more arousal, they're not able to communicate, articulate that they need support. That increases aggression, which increases arousal, which increases more um, in, invasive uh, responses. And this is why this situation perpetuates um, for, for months or years. Now, um, I'm not gonna read everything that's on here. I just wanna say that there's a precedence that the same sort of physiological arousal being, being predictive of behavior shows up in bipolar disorder, antisocial behavior. Um, it's a common symptomology of a biobehavioral coupling 
um, in these kind of uh, uh, externalized behaviors. So our hypothesis here is that physiological arousal precedes aggressive behavior. And what we're, our objective is to see if we can sense those changes in physiology prior to the onset of the behavior and then train machine learning classifiers to, to, to make a forecasted prediction in time before the behavior is going to occur. So previous results um, that we um, have generated and published demonstrated in 20 individuals with autism in psychiatric inpatient setting, one setting, that we could predict these behaviors one minute before they occurred using three minutes of prior biosensor data with 84% accuracy if we train the classifier in a person dependent way and then 70% accuracy one minute in advance if you train on everybody's data and you have one single classifier. As of today, we have 70 participants worth of data from three different um, psychiatric inpatient sites. These are, are mostly um, uh, minimally verbal, uh, intellectually impaired, and sensory sensitive individuals. And this is the sensing technology that we use. This is a commercial sensor um, called the E4 by Empatica. Um, back in the day before I came to Northeastern, we had developed a predicate device to this that then got spun out and commercialized by this company. It's recording cardiovascular data through photoplasmography on the wrist. That's where we can get heart rate and heart rate variability. It records electrodermal activity, which is a sympathetic um, nervous system measure of increased sweat. It's got the three axis acceleration for mo uh, motion like I showed you before. And then using thermopile, uh, it's looking at skin surface temperature. So these are worn by the inpatients with autism. And then we've developed an app at Northeastern that uh, enables you to make time stamped annotations of the topography and its onset and offset. So, so research assistants who are in these clinical settings are using, these, um, using this app to essentially annotate what they're observing um, in, the, in the participant who is wearing the sensor. So in the 70s worth of data, we had 500 hours of data collection across those three settings. Um, there were 429 different discrete data collection sessions for these 70 people. In those 500 hours, we observed 6,665 total challenging behaviors with concurrent biosensor data. And you can see the distribution of aggression to ED is emotion dysregulation or tantrum. SIB is self-injurious behavior. And um, using uh, ridge regularized log logistic regression after we've done the feature formulation with our classifiers, what we basically have demonstrated now is we can predict these behaviors three minutes before they occur with an average of 80% accuracy. When you leave a person out for train and test, when you leave sessions out for train and test, and when you look at test retest reliability or stability over multiple recordings from the same individual over time. So there's sort of two things that we're currently doing and then I'm, I'm wrapping up Vance. Um, more advanced analytics at Northeastern where we're looking at support vector machines and convolutional neural networks as a way to see if we can um, make further, further predictions out in time or increase our accuracy. We're also looking at this as a multi-class problem, not a single class problem. So how well can we differentiate aggression from self-injury, from tantrum, the interventions could be potentially different depending on um, which of those behaviors someone is engaging in. And then developing non-homogeneous Poisson process models, um, more probabilistic metrics. So instead of saying something's gonna happen in a discrete unit of time, can we have a running moving average estimate of the likelihood of this behavior increasing um, onset or offset? At the same time, uh, I've also been working with people outside of Northeastern developing assistive technologies where we can do all of our, anal our, our uh, machine learning now online. So everything I showed you before is capturing the data, it's storing it, it's doing analysis offline and then kind of generating uh, probabilistic results based on real data, but there's no functional use of that data in real time. Now we've got it where the sensor can stream to the phone where the behaviors are being annotated. Both forms of data are being sent to the cloud. Classifier is running in real time and then is pushing notifications back down to caregivers in the, in the unit saying you've got X amount of time before we predict the behavior is going to happen so that we can try to see if giving the alerts versus not enables them to engage in preparatory intervention to see if we can prevent or mitigate or reduce the occurrence or the um, severity of these behaviors and then evaluate that in a randomized trial. 
So super quickly, what I hope I can just sort of convince you of, at least in those two examples, is if we can start combining more sensing technology, more data scientists, in addition to the helping professions, psychologists and behavior analysts, there are a number of different affordances that may produce higher quality, more useful and, and more translational um, research that can assist with clinical care. And I wanna thank obviously the other investigators and students and funders who support this work and let this group know if they don't know already that we have a joint PhD program between Bouvet and Khoury called Personal Health Informatics. And um, we love it if you get the word out for interdisciplinary faculty or students who seek to combine computing science um, with health science, we have a home for you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. I, I'll clap again because I'm unmuted again. But thank you. Uh, we are, we've are we run pretty close to our 4.30 uh, end of time slot. I'm happy to take questions. But yeah, I, if anyone's willing to stay on, um, we got some time. Any questions? I have a question. Please. Um, so Matthew, I, I really like your research on the um, uh, the stereotypical motor movements uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned human annotation of videos uh, were not as reliable as we would hope. Uh, but on the other hand, sometimes uh, the predictive uh, modeling would have to find ground truths to rely on. and. Uh, uh, in, in your research, how do you make decisions on um, the, uh, the finding the ground truth uh, that you really trust to, to look for the uh, reliable uh, machine learning uh, uh, markers that you produce from your um, uh, from your bowel sensors? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. This is always the most painful part of the research too. So what it means is an army of undergraduate Bouvet students, typically, sometimes Curie students, um, using um, uh, video annotation software, going frame by frame watching these videos um, and, and landmarking them, and then independently somebody else coming and doing the same thing until we have, have 90 or percent or greater interior reliability, then we consider it ground truth. Once we've got the ground truth label, then we can sort of, you know, selectively start figuring out how much ground truth do we need before the classifier performs um, uh, automatically to, to, to get the same accuracy. Eventually, I would like to see more work and this Sarah uh, Ostadabas and I and Dennis or Dogmas and others have talked about um, trying to automate some of the labeling. Um, this is sort of pushing the boundaries of where we are with AI right now, but, but uh, unlabeled data where we're looking at things like recurrence um, quantization or where you've got similar profiles in one individual that you can spot in another one um, topographically and, and try to see if we can move this, because this is a bandwidth limiting feature of the pipeline is getting the algorithm trained. It's very efficient and scalable once it runs and you've got accuracy, but getting it trained to accuracy takes a very long time and is, is resource intensive. So if we can do work that gets us to human in the loop, um, so right now, right, we're training people to identify the behavior, document it accurately, then train the classifier. Well, another way is to do this in an unsupervised manner where the classifier says, I think the same thing just reoccurred, and then only showing those segments of the video to a human to say confirm, disconfirm that it is what it is. That would speed things up probably tenfold. Excellent question. In developmental psychology, uh, the eye tracking data uh, have been coded by by RAs, undergrad RAs for ages, and uh, we are also trying to look for ways to do that as well. Just yeah, uh, so that's a common the, that yeah. probably transcends the the population. The scientific question, just a, a general methodology for increasing the efficiency without sacrificing the accuracy of ground truth yeah. labels. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And if there are no other questions, then please join me in thanking both of our speakers once again. Uh, thank you so much. I, this was really interesting and I 
as people have said, it seems like there's um, quite a bit of room for collaboration and discussion here. Um, 